Um, For a snow slab to form, we need four ingredients. The first thing is unfavorable layering. This means we need the slab itself, this slab of snow that slides down, which in turn needs to be on top of a soft, weak layer. Otherwise, we're missing the requirement that will allow us to get the slab moving at all. The second thing we need is a skier, or the stress element, the initiation as it is referred to, so someone who triggers the slab. The third thing we need is the ability of the slab to propagate the crack in the weak layer. This way the slab gets really big and can release in one go. This ability to propagate is a particularly characteristic indication or criterion for these snow slabs that is difficult to assess. And the last ingredient we need, the fourth one, is sufficient slope steepness. As we've already heard, the snow will only start gliding on slopes of 30 degrees or steeper, and the average steepness for skier-triggered slab avalanches is 38 degrees. When estimating avalanche danger, it helps to compose a specific grid. And the ideal grid is this 3x3. Three 3x3 by three. Three by three means that for conditions, terrain, destination, and people, we take a look at the spatial levels, first the tour planning, then the tour in and of itself, and finally the individual slope. And this grid makes it easy to break down and deal with each of the aspects. The conditions component is in turn broken down further, namely into A, the weather, which of course influences us, but not only because the weather shapes the snowpack, but also because the weather can of course directly endanger us in the form of visibility, wind, and cold. And B, of course, the big component, the snowpack, so something that could potentially later blow up in our faces and that we must assess. So how is it structured? Where are the weak layers? How dangerous is it today? When it comes to weather parameters, we actually have three key areas. Precipitation, which predominantly refers to new snow but could also be rain. Wind, regarding the strength and direction of the wind. And temperature or sunshine, which refers to the amount of heat being added to the snowpack. When we look at precipitation, we have two major points. The first is precipitation in solid form, in the form of snow, which we take into consideration when planning a tour and also in the mountains. The second is rain. Rain is actually especially critical because nothing adds as much heat, as much melting energy to the snowpack as rain. Let's stick with snow for now. When it comes to snow, the main concern is the critical amount of new snow. So when temperatures are very low, the snow falling is dry and the surface is very smooth. The deposited snow can't bond well and is susceptible to stress. In this case, we can predominantly expect loose snow avalanches. But when a certain wind blows, in addition to the unfavorable conditions such as low temperatures and a smooth surface, then you rapidly reach the risky limit of the new snow problem, the critical amount of new snow. This means that even 10 to 20 centimeters is critical. When the snow falls very slowly, the temperature is just below zero, and the amount doesn't exceed half a meter, you would call these favorable conditions. Generally, when the old snowpack is coarsely structured, uneven, rough, then you can enjoy a day in the powder even with 30 to 50 centimeters of new snow. When it comes to temperature, there is a kind of normal distribution. So very cold is bad, very warm is bad, in between is not so bad. So very cold means extreme sub-zero temperatures. In this range we get a lot of faceting. Weak layers could potentially form in the snowpack. Very warm temperatures, especially when they occur very quickly or are caused by rain, lead to extreme water infiltration in the upper layers and therefore to an increase in avalanche danger due to this water infiltration. And in the mid-range the effects are more likely very slow or even positive because the snowpack settles and effectively bonds together much better. For snow, the mid-range is around minus 5 degrees, minus 3 degrees. When it comes to snow, everything around zero or above is extremely warm. And for snow, very cold means minus 15, minus 20 degrees, just to put it into context.
The wind is the architect of avalanches. Wind is responsible for the formation of fresh snowdrifts. This means there is a wind-drifted snow problem. If you can judge the direction and strength of the wind, you can really tackle the avalanche problem. This means if you identify where the wind-drifted snow is found, you can avoid these snowdrifts and find a good line to travel down safely. Basically, when it comes to snow being drifted by the wind, there are two different areas. The first is blowing snow, which means you have precipitation, snowfall plus wind. In this case, the snowflakes are directly drifted and transported from the windward to the leeward side, mechanically broken down by the wind, bonded, and thus form snowdrifts. The second is drifting snow. This means even when the weather is fine, a strong wind can erode the snow surface. Like a sandblaster, the snow sweeps up snow crystals from the ground and transports them from the windward to the leeward side. This means that fresh snowdrifts can be created even in periods of fine weather, if there are sufficiently strong winds over 40 kilometers per hour. Significantly more than 50% of avalanche accidents are associated with the wind-drifted snow problem. Therefore, if you can make a good estimate of the location and severity of the wind-drifted snow problem, you can greatly reduce your risk. I can find the entire progression of weather conditions throughout the winter in the snowpack. I'll find warm periods, warm phases, in the form of melt-freeze metamorphism in the snowpack structure. Faceted crystals are evidence of long, cold periods. If it has rained, I'll find an ice crust caused by the rain. And so the snowpack is effectively a mirror image of the progression of the weather. If we now take a look at our avalanche problems, they can actually all be exactly ascribed to the weather as well, to these different influencing factors. Relevant to us is precipitation, the new snow problem. We have the wind, so the wind drifted snow problem. We have temperature, or temperature increase, therefore the wet snow problem. And due to the cold, we have this persistent weak layer problem, which is not a direct effect, but faceted, loose crystals are formed due to the cold. And sometime later, these are covered by wind and precipitation, and the problem is then saved here in the snowpack, a persistent weak layer problem. This effectively means all weather factors create an avalanche problem, either in a negative sense or even in a positive sense. For example, when a temperature increase dispels a faceted weak layer in the snowpack. It can also have a repairing function. What this means for the weather and for the snowpack and the avalanche danger can be visualized using an example. Let's assume we have had cold, fine weather for a relatively long time without going radiation at night. Now the snow will build up on the surface. This means that large faceted crystals, very loose snow, will form, perfect for skiing, like old loose granular snow or sugar snow, as it is sometimes known, which actually doesn't present any danger at all. And next, for example, we have light precipitation. It starts snowing. This faceted layer is now covered, and then the wind starts. So more snow is added by the new snowfall, but also by the snow that is deposited on top by the wind, but the wind also packs it. So the crystals are broken up, densely packed, and become brittle, the perfect slab. Another contributing factor is the terrain. We know that avalanches are more easily triggered on steep slopes than on gentle slopes. The higher the danger level, the more slopes can be triggered, the easier the slopes are to trigger. When combined with slope steepness, it becomes clear. The higher the danger level, you should choose the gentler slopes. Because when the danger level is high, you also have to consider remote triggering and spontaneous avalanche release. This means that the slope steepness limit of 30 degrees is generally always relevant. But at higher danger levels, avalanches can spontaneously release in distant hazard zones and endanger a group. When it comes to terrain, it is important to watch out for terrain traps. This means escarpments, gullies, ditches should be avoided without exception. Here you have to primarily consider the consequences. That means that if you fall over a wall of rock, you don't need the addition of the avalanche for the results to be fatal anyway. 
and in ditches, even a small avalanche is enough to bury you very deeply. The consequences are correspondingly dramatic here too. This means that terrain traps are always the top priority when assessing the terrain. Generally, there are also favorable terrain features such as terraces, undulating terrain. Broad ridges that are not too steep are more favorable than very structureless, steep slopes where there are major differences in the depth of snow. Now let's take a look at the mechanics of our snow slab. I have a weak layer underneath and the slab is on top of that. Now it can happen that the whole thing becomes unbalanced at some point. We call this a spontaneous avalanche release. For example, when a large mass is packed on top, so even more new snow, more wind drifted snow, or even rain, so an additional load forms on top. And on a steep slope, this weak layer below can no longer bear the whole load, and an avalanche then happens. But it could also be, as is often the case, so in 95% of cases, that something specific stresses this slope, which is called an initiation. The skier skis onto the slope and reaches the weak layer. Due to their body weight, their load, they really reach this faceted weak layer and stress it in just one small place, only under their skis. And the next question now, that there is a crack, that the weak layer has collapsed is, will it spread, will it propagate, or will it stop? And if both the slab and the weak layer are fully spread out over a large area, then I have this situation where this slab suddenly goes within a fraction of a second, this crack spreads and the entire slab starts to slide all at once. When it comes to avalanche danger, the people factor plays a particularly major role. 95% of avalanches are triggered by tours and free riders themselves. This means that if we behave correctly, we can prevent the majority of accidents.